Um, he is a professor in the Conservation and Biology and Ecology program at Montana State University. Uh, Creel has spent over 30 years studying lions, wolves, and other carnivores across both Africa and North America. He spans a number of discipli disciplines, which I'm sure he's going to get into today, um, but including behavioral ecology, population biology, conservation, behavioral endocrinology, and evolutionary ecology. His research is based on field studies, generally using observational methods, and then following uh, known individuals. His work is involved in integration of behavioral and demographic data from the field, and then physiological and genetic data uh, from the lab. Uh, Professor Creel is looking at the ways that predators affect prey, other than just simply killing them, identifying responses to predation risk and measuring their costs. This work has won him the Carl Gustav Bernard Medal from the Royal Swedish uh, Academy of Sciences, and recently his focus has shifted to integrating data through these high throughput sequencing into analyses of the ways that humans impact connectivity between, between ecosystems. His current field research is in the Zambian carnivore program, examining carnivore conservation, ecology, behavior, and genetics in three various ecosystems, which I think we might be able to hear about today. Um, and this work provides basic understanding and data for conservation and management on population size, survival, reproduction, uh, distributions, movements, and the factors that, that impact them. What might be less known about Scott um, and will not be the subject of the talk today, but he's also the USA National Summer Biathlon team. He was on it twice um, and is a pr prolific athlete. And I read that you once tried to outrun a wildebeest, which maybe we can talk about in the coffee chat, which is happening at 1.15 to 2.15. So if you want to have more time with Scott, you can come to that. Thank you very much. Without any ado, Scott. So I can tell you, you can't outrun a wildebeest. You can try, but it won't happen. Um, what I'd like to talk about today is uh, you know, reflected in the title here, uh, Carnivores Competition and Connectivity. Uh, and this, uh, this is, uh, as Kagi mentioned, sort of a new angle in my research uh, that comes from having spent the first sabbatical of my career in northern Sweden last year working with a colleague who is developing high throughput sequencing methods to gain data that can be integrated with the kind of work that I normally do on carnivore conservation. Um, that was home, which is roughly the size of two Volvo V50s for a year. Um, but uh, it was a good opportunity to learn a lot. Uh, and I want to just sort of set the stage by talking about the issues that, that, that my work focuses on go through some ecological impacts of humans on carnivores, and then uh, start talking about evolutionary impacts that we're having on them also. So as noted here, um, large carnivores in general are uh, canaries in the coal mine for human effects on ecosystems. They require large areas that have to be ecologically quite intact in order to persist. They're high in the food web, and they have large home ranges and they, uh, an ecosystem can't degrade too far before they don't have the conditions they need to persist. And because they range so widely, they need very big protected areas to persist at all uh, in numbers more than just a few. Uh, and uh, here's a paper that came out a few years ago in science, uh, including Oz Schmitz is one of the people who did it, basically summarizing the patterns globally of the factors that affect large carnivores and cause them to be, uh, to be so many of them to be threatened or endangered. And you see some commonalities um, that sort of just reiterate the points I was just making. You have uh, habitat loss and fragmentation. They require large areas that, that need to be ecologically quite intact to persist. Uh, persecution or conflicts with humans. The, they're large enough to kill livestock and, and even kill people. Uh, and that leads to retaliatory killing and, 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 and make them harder to be con conserved. Depletion of prey is a serious issue. Uh, maintaining the prey base that these things rely upon is not an easy task in itself. And then uh, because they are sort of so socially and culturally important in so many places, there's uh, the traditional use of, of, of their, pot, their parts. And I'll be talking about that a bit at the end. So all these things combine, and you can see them mapped out in the world here. And I've highlighted the location of Zambia, which is where the data I'm going to be talking to you come from. Uh, just so that you can take a look at these maps and see that, yes, indeed, all these issues are issues for large carnivores in Zambia. Um, and it's a little bit of a double-edged sword to be in the bright colors here because it indicates that, that you have high, many species threatened by that problem in that place. 
but that also means you still have many large carnivore species in that place. Uh, so a lot of the places with the cooler colors doesn't indicate low problems. It just indicates that we've already removed the large carnivores from those places. Um, so, uh, but Zambia, you can see the issues, uh, all of these issues that we're focusing on uh, here in this review paper are important for large carnivores in Zambia. And, and here's the location of Zambia in Africa. Uh, and I really want to emphasize that Zambia is a critical place for large carnivore conservation, partly because of its location. It's the hub of a wheel that, that involves nine nations that hold very significant fractions of the large carnivores laugh, left in sub-Saharan Africa because of its geographic location, but also because it's been very successful in conservation. There's a large uh, protected area complex in the eastern part of the country centered on, on the Luangwa Valley, which is one of our study sites. There's a large protected area complex in the center, Kafui National Park in the adjacent. These lighter green areas are game management areas with lower levels of protection than the national park, but still protected. Uh, and then in the west, over by the border with Angola, is Lua Plain, which has the second largest wildebeest migration in the world after Serengeti. Uh, they migrate back and forth between uh, Zambia and Angola uh, and the game management areas surrounding it. So uh, these three protected area complexes are by themselves important strongholds for large carnivore conservation uh, because they're big and relatively intact. But then if you look around the, the fringes of the map, you see uh, you know, you, from Angola to the DRC to Tanzania, Malawi, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Botswana right here, and Namibia, uh, eight nations bordering Zambia that also hold significant populations of these carnivores. And when I begin talking about connectivity later, uh, that's, that's going to be an issue we're going to focus on is, is uh, the permeability between these locations and the factors that affect how well they connected are, how well connected they are for different species. Just to set the stage of the players, uh, the five large carnivores that I'm going to be talking to you about are uh, in descending order of size, the lion, Panthera leo, um, the spotted hyena, Crocuda crocuda, I feel like the cub is saying, you wish your mother was this cool in the lion picture. And the mom is saying, you wish your cub was this cool in this picture. Uh, the, the leopard, Panthera partis, the cheetah, Sinanix jubatus. This is Lua, by the way. Uh, and the African wild dog, Lycaean pictus. One thing you may have noticed on the little tour of, uh, of species names is that um, Three of these are monotypic genera. So, you know, if we lose these things, we're not just losing little twigs of the evolutionary tree, we're losing a genus. Uh, and the two Panthera species we're talking about here are two of the four in that genus as well. So uh, these things are, are, are ecologically and evolutionarily quite important, but also economically and culturally important to the places where they are. Um, and one of the things that we've learned about this large carnivore guild, the five species I'm just talking about, is that a lot about their ecology and population dynamics is affected by interspecific competition. Interspecific competition is an important structuring force in this, this guild because they rely upon a heavily overlapping set of prey in each of the ecosystems they've been studied in, and they compete for it. And the, the adaptations they have for killing prey are also very effective in competition. So uh, food stealing is very common, where the subordinate members of the guild, which are primarily the cheetah and the African wild dog, frequently lose food to the dominant members of the guild, which are predominantly the lions and the hyenas. The leopards I'm not going to talk about too much uh, from this point out, because their ability to climb trees has sort of caused them to have a unique adaptation that causes them to function a little differently then the two subordinates, which are the cheetah and the wild dog, and the two dominants, which are the lion and the hyena. Uh, but food loss is an important problem for cheetahs everywhere they've been studied, and for African wild dogs. And direct killing is an important force in this guild, too. The subordinate co competitors are commonly killed by the dominant competitors uh, to the extent that amongst known cause mortality, predation by dominant competitors can be the most common cause of death. Um, Interestingly enough, no hyenas were harmed in the making of this talk. Um, this is a picture taken by, by my PhD student, Egil Droga, and uh, right after the picture was taken, the lion dropped the hyena, who dusted herself off and trotted away. 
amazingly enough. Um, but you can imagine that interactions like that put a dent in your population dynamics, and they do. Um, so uh, across ecosystems, there's a negative relationship between the densities of the subordinate competitors and the dominant competitors, uh, which by itself doesn't prove that it's causal, that competition is driving this pattern. But there is, both within ecosystems that have been studied for a long time, as the densities of the dominant competitors rises, the density of the competitive, subordinate competitors drops. And when you look across ecosystems, you also see that same pattern. And where competition is an important limiting effect, you expect to see niche, niche partitioning. We expect to see the subordinate competitors uh, avoiding the dominant competitors in time or in space or by dietary niche partitioning. And, and in fact, we do. Many studies in many ecosystems over several decades have shown that both spatially and temporally and in regards to their diets, the subordinate competitors avoid the niche space that's occupied by the dominant competitors. So that negative relationship in their densities probably is causal. Uh, and here's an example from the Lua ecosystem, the one over in the western part of the country by the Angola border that I was talking about earlier, uh, where um, this is the outline of a study area of approximately 2,000 square kilometers. Uh, and you can see where uh, the hunting conditions are good is heat mapped here, where the white is where uh, most of the feeding occurs. And you can see, as in most ecosystems, the density, the local density of lions correlates very tightly with the local density of prey. The lions monopolize the best part of the ecosystem. And the hyenas, to some extent, do as well. There's not much spatial avoidance of lions by hyenas. So the two dominant competitors uh, create, there's a hot spot for competition in the same place where the feeding conditions are best. And African wild dogs in this ecosystem, as in most, tend to avoid that area. But that comes at a cost. To avoid the dominant competitors, you're also avoiding the area where the prey availability is highest. And there's lots of studies showing energetic costs of that to, to the subordinate competitors. So those drive, these competitive dynamics have important implications for the ecology and population dynamics of the subordinate competitors. So here's where the human part of the story comes in, is that we are modifying the ecology of these species in ways that affects their ecological interactions with one another. So we're not just directly depressing their population densities through our actions. We're also affecting the way they affect one another in important ways, ecologically, and in the main focus of this talk will be look at the, looking at the evolutionary aspect of that. Uh, the biggest effect is uh, that I'm going to talk about today, at least, is prey depletion through wire snaring. So uh, here you have a patrol from the, the Zambian Department of National Parks and Wildlife collecting wire snares. Uh, and the way that wire snares work, if you haven't encountered them, is that you don't want to encounter them. Um, it's just a loop of wire um, where uh, Twisted in one end of it is just a small loop, and it's fed back through that loop, and then anchored to a tree or a bush or something like that. And then the people setting the snares out will either use game paths that are created through vegetation naturally, or they'll create uh, breaks by cutting branches that force animals into the gaps, and they put the snares in the gaps. And these, uh, these snares are not set to catch carnivores, but they do cause direct mortality of carnivores. Whatever walks through the gap next is what will be snared. Uh, and the way these snares work is it's just sort of like a ratchet. As it tightens up, uh, even though there's nothing physically keeping the snare from opening, when it's under tension, it just it doesn't loosen. It just gets tighter and tighter and tighter. Uh, so whatever he walks in gets caught. So there's direct mortality, but there's also prey depletion uh, because these are set in places that are intended to maximize their efficiency at catching ungulates. Uh, you know, the, the people are setting the snares to get the same things that the, that the carnivores are looking for. And in the Kafui ecosystem, the one in central Zambia that I was showing you, we had an unusual opportunity to look at how this is affecting patterns of prey selection over a long period of time. There was a nice study done in the 1950s by Mitchell, uh, who was a game warden in the park at the time, where he gathered these data that were published in the 1960s of the diets of leopards, lions, wild dogs, and cheetahs in Kafui. There are not many hyenas in Kafui is why they're absent there. And this is uh, each of the columns of this figure is a prey type arranged from smallest over here to largest over here. So over here, we have diker and grizzbuck, very small species. And over here, you have uh, hippo and buffalo, very large species. Um, 
And you can see what the diets of the, the four carnivores that are common in the ecosystem used to be, what their dietary niches were, and what they are now. And what's fairly obvious, even without statistics, is that you can see there was a lot of predation on larger species 50 years ago relative to what we have now. Predation on large species has decreased dramatically, especially for the lion which uh, used to, in this ecosystem, be a buffalo specialist. That's buffalo, that's zebra. Um, larger than median prey were what lions were primarily preying on 50 years ago. And now we see lions preying much more heavily on small species that overlap with the diets of the leopard, the wild dog, and the cheetah, the subordinate competitors. So we're not only reducing prey densities, we're particularly reducing the density of large prey which reduces the capacity of the subordinate competitors to use niche partitioning to coexist with the dominant competitors. Uh, and if you look at the changes, uh, there's a, a tendency for small prey to increase in their representation in the diets over 50 years, but there's a very pronounced pattern that larger than medium prey have decreased in their importance in the diets of these carnivores, especially the larger ones, the lions. So the ability of the species to avoid competition is being affected by our impacts on the ecosystem through snaring. We don't directly have data on what the densities of the prey animals were 50 years ago, but we can confirm that those small things that have increased in importance are the most common species in the ecosystem now. This is based on seven years of prey transects using distance sampling in a very systematic way to account for variation in the probability of detection of small and large species. Um, and you can see that the larger species are now existing at relatively low densities. So we know that the large species have become less important in their diets, and we know that they are now uncommon. Uh, so the most logical explanation is that depletion of the large prey has, has compressed the niches and affected the competitive interactions. The, uh, the four small, small species that I have uh, highlighted here in blue are, are indeed uh, the four most common species in the ecosystem now based upon systematic sampling over seven years. So the warthog, the impala, the puku, and I don't have a slide, but uh, 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 reedbuck are the, the fourth most important prey in this ecosystem now. So all small species. Uh, that is not what lions were making their living on when they had a choice. When buffalo were still common in the ecosystem, the most common prey was buffalo. But uh, as this has become less common, they're all compressed into the same niches. So to summarize where we are now, I mean, we know those were data from Kafui that I was just showing you, and the, prey, the avoidance was from Lua. We know that human impacts on these ecosystems are not only just directly affecting population sizes. We know that they're also affecting ecological interactions between species within the ecosystems that are exacerbating the problem of conserving these things, which are rare to begin with. But what I want to focus on for the rest of the time is sort of a new angle to the research to look at what affects the connectivity between these ecosystems. Because these populations are small, um, really the persistence of these species and certainly the persistence of their normal evolutionary trajectories is going to depend upon connections between ecosystems. If they aren't connected, the populations are really too small to, um, to be continuing on the evolutionary trajectories that they were on until we started messing with them. Uh, and that's, that's the question I would like to address, and in particular, uh, the way we looked at this with some research that we published last year was to look at how the human footprint affects connectivity between ecosystems for different members of the guild, and are they affected the same way or differently. And to do this, we used uh, uh, this uh, human footprint index that's been developed by Oscar Venter and his colleagues, which I feel is very valuable because it's mapped at one square kilometer resolution for the entire world and downloadable. We can all use the same currency to be looking for effects on our species and get much more comparability between studies than we would if we all use some idiosyncratic measure of human, human effect. Uh, so that's one thing I like about it, although it's a thing it's also sometimes criticized for, is that it's too generic. Uh, but what, the, what this human footprint index does is, I think, takes a pretty sensible set of indicators that can be mapped at that scale that could affect the connectivity, be, uh, you know, the, the permeability of the landscape to the species that we're interested in. These are things that I think will affect the permeability of the landscape for the species I'm interested in. 
So uh, built environments, crops, pasture, population density. Night lights uh, basically is an index for the level of development for the population development that you have in an area, the population size you have in an area. Railways, roadways, and navigable waterways, so linear features that might cut off movements as well as human population centers. Uh, and these guys have done the heavy lifting of digitizing those data for the entire world so that you can look at the impacts on your species. Uh, and moreover, a paper that came out uh, two years ago now showed that this human footprint index can predict animal movements quite effectively across a large set of species that move on the landscape at a wide range of scales. So uh, this paper by uh, Tucker et al. showed that for things that move on a scale of just a few meters a day to things that move on a scale of hundreds of kilometers, so you know three orders of magnitude in, in the typical movements of these things, how are their movements affected by the human footprint index? Which maps out from zero to 40. So for each of these eight variables that they combine, in each pixel, those are scored uh, from one to five, categorized from one, uh, one to five. So the, the highest human footprint is a value of 40, and the lowest is zero, is the way the scales. And here you see it mapped out, where the darker colors are, are higher footprint index, and the lighter colors are lower human footprint index. And each of the dots is a location where they did a study to look at the, in, the, the association between movements and the human footprint in that index. And here's what they found. So they looked at, I think they did this very nicely in that they looked at typical movements. So the median mo distance moved each day or over a 10 day period. That's what you're seeing on the left. And then also large scale movements of the kind of thing that an animal would be doing if it was dispersing and trying to get between a pair of ecosystems. So that's the 95th quantile of the frequency distribution of movements that you're seeing on the right. So how are large scale dispersal type movements affected by the human footprint? And how are typical day to day movements affected by the human footprint? And in both cases, they found a negative association. So there is a correlation between the ability of the animals to move and the human footprint index. To me, this really provokes two in, in, interesting questions, which is what the rest of the talk is about. One is, do these effects on short-term movements, are they consistent enough that they also produce differences that are detectable genetically? So are we affecting gene flow when we're affecting these movement patterns? Uh, you know, it's not necessarily the case that that would have to be true, uh, but it's easy to test. And then the other question is that, okay, there's a negative association here, but there's also a hell of a lot of scatter. So what predicts whether you're a species that's above the line or a, a, a species below the line? You know, what explains these residuals where some species are fairly resistant to high levels of the human footprint index and others are not? Uh, can we get some sort of predictive theory about what kind of species are little affected and what kind of species are strongly affected? Uh, there's a lot of variation still to be explained there. Uh, and that's what I started thinking about for the animals I study. And again, uh, competition is a very important structuring effect in these communities. The difference between the subordinate competitors and the dominant competitors is pretty pronounced in many aspects of their ecology, and it may affect their ability to move through a landscape that's modified by humans. And I think that could work in two different directions. I think there's two plausible hypotheses that really the state of the game we're at now is that we need to empirically test it and see which ones have support. So uh, what I'm calling the competition movement connection hypothesis basically emphasizes that the adaptations of subordinate competitors to avoid places with high levels of competition on the landscape may, has made them good at avoiding bad places and finding good places. People have described the African wild dog as a fugitive species that persists in an ecosystem broadly by avoiding the locations with high levels of competition and locating the, the areas with lower competition and persisting in those locations. So if that ability generalizes to be able to move through a landscape that's made unfavorable not by dominant competitors but by people, then they should be able to get through the landscape a bit better. Uh, and that's what we're arguing here is that spatial avoidance of dominant competitors um, undeniably has produced an ability to traverse areas with unfavorable conditions with regard to their normal conditions they experience. And if that skill set is generalizable to other conditions, they may be able to move through areas that are, that are, that are affected by humans. So we should see uh, 
these species are well connected because their ability to, to move across unfavorable landscapes. And these species are less well connected because they haven't had to evolve that ability. That's this hypothesis. It's just a hypothesis at this point. On the other hand, uh, the dominant competitors invariably attain higher population densities in this guild. I forgot to mention it, but I had note scales on a slide back, and then I forgot to note the scales. But if you noted the scales, what you would have noticed is the densities of the lions and the hyenas are five to ten times higher than the densities of the, the wild dogs and the cheetahs, typically. You have many more lions and hyenas in the ecosystem than you do wild dogs and cheetahs, even though they're bigger. Uh, because of the effect of, of competition. So the bigger species attain higher population densities everywhere they've been studied, uh, and that will have two effects. One, it will reduce the effect of genetic drift between locations, so you get less population dis differentiation between ecosystems just because of them drifting apart in the large carnivores than in the small ones. It's also the case that a large population uh, given a constant individual migration rate, will produce a larger number of dispersers. So they should be better connected on that basis also. So the population density effect should run the opposite direction. If the effects of density dominate, these guys should be well connected, and you see little differentiation between ecosystems. If the effects of individual capacity for movement dominate, these guys should be well connected between ecosystems. So we can empirically test that. Uh, and that's what we set out to do uh, beginning last year um, using uh, high throughput sequencing to get uh, SNP genotypes in restriction site associated DNA. This is the thing that's getting easier and cheaper all the time. Uh, and it allows us to get low si uh, genotypes at three and a half thousand loci for a couple hundred lions in three ecosystems, and at two and a half thousand loci for a hundred individuals for wild dogs in three ecosystems. Ideally, these would have been the same three ecosystems, uh, but that's not the case in the data I'm going to show you. So Kafui and Luangwa, we have data for both lions and African wild dogs. We did not, and we have data for wild dogs in Lua as well, but we didn't use the lions in Lua for this analysis because, anyone got a wild guess why we didn't do that? They're translocated. We've already taken lions from Kafui to establish a lion population in Lua. So we know there will be genetic similarity between these two populations because we created it just a few years back. Uh, so that wouldn't be meaningful. And what we did instead is use lions in the, the nearest local equivalent. We used the Salu Game Reserve in Tanzania, which is in terms of distance, uh, a comparable site to use and also in terms of the human footprint intervening between the ecosystems. It was well matched in that regard. And uh, so what we did is uh, RAD sequencing, which uh, if you haven't used it, basically what it, it, what it does is you take uh, DNA and cut it with a restriction enzyme. Uh, and the restriction enzyme cuts at a given cutting sequence. Uh, so wherever that sequence occurs within the genome, you'll get a cut. Uh, and then you, uh, you subset a set of fragments that gets you the fraction of the genome, genome that you want to get enough information. And in our case, we used about 3% of the genome. So each of these fragments is a RAD. It's a chunk of restriction site associated DNA. It's next to a cutting site for that enzyme. And then within those RADs, you identify the SNPs, which are these single nucleotide polymorphisms, which are basically um, uh, well distributed throughout the genome in both functional genes and in non-transcribed DNA. So basically good measures of population differentiation. Um, and you, you identify the SNPs basically by stacking up the RADs and you, uh, you know, if it was the same at all, the, across all reads at this loca this base pair and this base pair and this base pair, you can math this out. And if it's 150 base pairs, each of which has four possibilities, um, who's got a phone? <clears throat> 150 to the fourth power. It's, it's got, no, it's 90 decimal points or something. Basically, the odds of this not being the same chunk of DNA are zero after you stack up 30 copies of it. But you find variation at one spot where a biallelic pair is repeated. That's a SNP. That's a single nucleotide polymorphism. Uh, so by stacking 30 deep, you can basically eliminate errors. Uh, 
You can use places with a little bit of allowable variation that are just genotyping errors to confirm that this is indeed a SNP. Uh, and that's where the 3,500 loci for the lions and the 2,500 for the wild dogs came from. So what does it show? Um, so with data like this, where you've got hundreds of individuals are the rows in your data and thousands of loci are the columns, uh, you need a way to cook down the variability across those thousands of loci to get some signal out. And the normal way to do that is some kind of ordination analysis, like principal components analysis or principal coordinates analysis. And this is a field that's fairly actively developing right now. Uh, and there's a Dutch by, uh, statistician, Lawrence van der Matten, who's developed this technique called T-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding, T-SNE, which is basically just a, uh, a better variation of things like principal components analysis, which just takes the variation across these thousands of loci and explains as much of it as possible with one variable. And then as much of the remaining variation as is possible with an orthogonal second variable, and then a third and a fourth and so on. And I'm just showing you the first two. Um, and uh, if you haven't encountered this T-SNE, I'd definitely suggest you go take a look at it. I think its advantages over things like PCA and PCOA are pretty, pretty strong. Um, he's got a great talk that you can Google up that he gave to Google on using this as a, a method of solving problems they have that are complicated, This like the facial recognition and whatnot. Um, but it worked quite well. And what you see when you do this, so color coding the ecosystems, there is much less differentiation between ecosystems in wild dogs than there is in lions. Lions are genetically distinct amongst ecosystems far more than wild dogs are. So initially, pretty strong support for the idea that the individual capacity for wild dogs to move connects ecosystems and prevents differentiation much better than the large population size of lions connects to ecosystem. If the individuals were equal, equal, the lions would be much better connected than the wild dogs because their populations are much larger. But we see the opposite, uh, suggesting the individual capacity is, is stronger. I mean, indeed, the two most distinct individuals in that data set, the two points that are farthest apart, are in one ecosystem. So the two, the, the, the two wild dogs that are most dissimilar live together in Luangwa, uh, and they're more different from one another than a wild dog in Kafui or a wild dog in Lua. Uh, the reason the Lua data are so pathetic um, is they went extinct while we were watching them. So, um, you know, this is happening before our eyes that we are losing these things from these ecosystems. Uh, it's not theoretical. It's, it's, it's happening. So the differentiation, you know, we're looking like individual capacity connects things better for the wild, the subordinate competitors than for the dominants, but we haven't related it to the human footprint yet. And that's what you're seeing here is the human footprint index mapped out for Zambia. This is the boundaries of Zambia. Uh, and the, the, this is this viridus color scale where these are places with high human footprint and the, the dark blue areas are places with low human footprint. So what you're seeing here are these mega capitals. That's Harare in Zimbabwe. That's Lilongwe in Malawi. That's Lusaka, the capital of Zambia. This is Bujumbura in the Dem Democratic Republic of Congo. Big, you know, multi-million human cities. And this is the Copper Belt. Uh, this is a, an area with cop copper and diamonds that's uh, economically very important, and that's why there's such high human footprint there. And then there's high human footprint connecting the Copper Belt with the capital within Lusaka. I mean, in fact, you can see, <laughs> you can see colonial history right here. The whole reason this projection of the DRC sticks right there next to all this is because back when the Belgians were the colonial power, they said, yeah, we'll have that. Uh, and that little appendix on the Congo is basically a holdover of the Belgians, you know, wanting those resources. Um, so, and you have areas that are quite dark. Uh, this is mostly the Luango ecosystem. This is mostly the Kafui ecosystem in places where the human footprint is weaker. Now, uh, to look at how this affects movement, we used circuit models, which have been around for quite a while now, and probably most of you have seen them, where basically you can take that mapping of the human footprint and draw a parallel to the flow of current through an electrical circuit, saying where is the resistance high and where is the resistance low. And, and uh, the parallel is, is exact. These models came from, from, from electrical engineering, uh, 
where if you think of two nodes in a circuit and the amount of current that flows between A and B will depend upon the resistance of the circuits that connect them, you can think of two populations on a landscape and the gene flow between them depends upon the resistance that's created by human impact between the ecosystems. And this can be done in more than one way. The sort of simple-minded way that doesn't make much sense for large carnivores is to identify the least cost path between two places. And you know, if, if the carnivores were likely to repeat one another's movements when they were dispersing between ecosystems, that least cost pathway would be important to identify. But probably the way these ecosystems are connected is by many potential routes of movement that they're always exploring and sometimes making it through and sometimes dying on the way. Uh, and that's what circuit theory does nicely, is it considers all possible paths between point A and point B and gets this integrated measure of the resistance between the locations. And that's what you're seeing mapped out here. The base colors, so with wild dogs on the left and lions on the right, there's, there's three things to pay attention to here. Uh, one, the, the point colors are similar if the genotypes are similar. What we're seeing here is genetic similarity mapped out by similarity in the point colors of individuals that were sampled in those locations and then genotyped at two and a half or three and a half thousand loci. And then how far apart the points are, obviously that's geographic distance. And then the resistance between the pair of locations is mapped out by the color of the base map, where the hot colors are places where we expect uh, little resistance due to human footprint and the cold colors are where there should be uh, high resistance to the human footprint. So this is current, not resistance. This is how connected they are, the, the hot colors. Um, and so for instance, you can see that here's an area between Lua and Kafui that should be pretty well connected if you just drift up a little bit north and come back south again. But if you tried to go this way, you would encounter more resistance uh, is what you're seeing out there. So, uh, sort of the take home of this part of the talk is that when we look at the correlation between the genetic similarity between a pair of dogs and their geographic distance, we find very little correlation. They're very well connected. So geographic distance doesn't explain genetic similarity very well, nor does the human footprint. So they're pretty good at getting through areas of the landscape that have high resistance. They are making their way through still, and that's a good news story. Uh, for the lions, we see just the opposite pattern. These points between the three ecosystems are very different in color. So the set of lions you have in Salu are similar to one another, but very different than the lions you have in Luangwa, who are similar to one another, but very different than the lions you have in Kafui, unlike what we're seeing for the dogs here. And that correlates with geographic distance. So an isolation by distance model does significantly predict the patterns we see in the lions. But significantly, and if you're going to remember only one thing today, remember this, the human footprint predicts it a lot better. Um, so we've already got our signature on their evolutionary processes. We can explain the current patterns of genetic differentiation better with the human footprint than we can with, with isolation by distance. And again, we're just using the untuned version of this human footprint index that you know, weights each of those eight variables equally. The odds are that if we go in there and fine tune a model that selects, that weights those variables in a way that's mo more appropriate to the species, that this correlation will only get stronger. So this is a pretty strong support for this idea and not support for this idea. So definitely recognizing that we're only talking about a pair of species and definitely recognizing that we're only looking at a few ecosystems, uh, the, the, the initial support seems to be that the individual capacity for movement has better predictive ability on which species remain co connected than the population sizes do. It outweighs the differences in population size. Um, so I, I think that indicates that you know, not only are we, we know we're affecting their population sizes, we know we're affecting their ecology within the ecosystems, and we know we've also been affecting their gene flow between ecosystems long enough to see the signal already. Um, in rapidly evolving markers. Um, so that I think is important in, in trying to come up with guidance for the conservation of these species. Now, um, I wanna spend just a, just a couple minutes talking about a more direct use of these data for conservation of these animals also, uh, which is that there's a rising trade in body parts of African felids. Uh, as the tiger trade has decreased, 
along with the tigers, unfortunately, um, and gotten under control, uh, markets are starting to get stronger for uh, other felids that are either sold as fake tiger parts or they're just sold for the same purpose. And leopards, uh, cheetahs, and lions were seeing more and more traffic, uh, but also some of these other things that basically can be confused for them and therefore can be sold uh, for the same purpose. The trade is increasing. And the problem that the Zambia Department of National Parks and Wildlife has is the seizures are not in the ecosystems usually. These skins are seized in big cities and border posts mainly. It, it, they're, they're seized in transit. So nobody really knows where they came from. Now they can interview the people that they arrested when they seized the samples, uh, but you know it's not entirely clear whether a person's going to give you an honest answer on where the thing came from. And they've often changed hands, so the person who has it doesn't even know where it came from. Uh, these genotypes obviously have the information in them needed to take a cat skin and say where it came from. Um, and that's uh, a thing that we're doing with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service now, is taking these sea samples and providing data that allows them to know where they came from so that they can more effectively target the anti-poaching efforts to protect the cats. Um, now to do that, you might think that you would use the same kind of ordination, the same sort of t SNE data that we were looking at before, but that's not actually a great tool to answer this question. Uh, what you want to know here, you want a method that distinguishes populations as effectively as a possible. What t SNE or PCA or PCOA does is it takes the variation in the genotypes and partitions it into a smaller number of variables that contains the maximum amount of variation. That's not the same as identifying the groups that are most dissimilar from one another in the data. That's what discriminant analysis does. And discriminant analysis, unfortunately, if these are individuals and these are genotypes, you need fewer variables than you have samples to do a discriminant analysis. But if you've got three and a half thousand genotypes and a couple hundred samples, you can't do it. What Thibault Jambert, a French numerical ecologist, came up with is a really neat uh, solution to this problem where you first run a PCA on your data, and what does that give you? That gives you a small number of variables that explains most of the variation in the data. And then you run a discriminant analysis on the PCA components. That's DAPC, discriminant analysis of principal components, uh, which uh, Thibault Jambart developed a few years back. And, and as you can see, uh, it discriminates uh, genetic groups in the lion data quite nicely. And those genetic groups mostly assigned to single ecosystems. So we can tell the authorities where these skins came from with pretty low ambiguity. If it's in one of these clusters, it's from Salu. If it's from this cluster, it's probably from Kafui, but it might be possibly from Luangwa. If it's from this cluster, it's from Luangwa, with a small probability of it being from Kafui. And this is just the first pass at the data. We can probably get the resolution of this better. You also see an interesting thing here that the Salu is the biggest protected area in Africa and has the largest lion population in Africa. It also has the most genetic variability in that lion population left. Um, so uh, we see that too. We can validate the method pretty nicely. And we now have uh, samples from 22 locations distributed throughout a lot of the lion's range that we'll be able to genotype to identify what the genotypes look like as potential source populations. So most of the places these lion skins could be coming from, uh, we should be able to assign them back to here uh, within about a year. <clears throat> so there's both these broader issues that I was talking about early about looking at these impacts upon the ecology and the evolutionary biology, and I think also these narrower things of just you know, providing a tool to the authorities to try and get an obvious immediate threat under control. Uh, and uh, with that, I would just like to thank the many, many people that I've worked with on this. Uh, my collaborators, graduate students, a set of proto-grad students who are paying their dues in the field now and will soon be grad students if we can just find some money. Um, a bunch of undergraduates, including a bunch who've uh, gone over to work in the field for us. Uh, and a bunch of Zambian collaborators who are uh, a big part of our team over there. And with that, I'd just like to say thanks very much for inviting me. Questions? Yeah, there's one. There's one. <laughs>
Hi, uh, thank you. So in your different competition movement hypotheses, uh, you didn't talk much about social structure. And I know that lions and wild dogs are both group living species, but I think perhaps there might be some differences in social dynamics. Could you explain how that might impact their genetic connectivity or movement patterns? Yeah, so that's a very good point and, and one that there's still a lot of thinking to be done is that there are a lot of factors other than their position in, within this competitive hierarchy that could also affect connectivity. So um, I kind of intentionally as a first pass wanted to test whether comp, you know, this, this, this a priori hypothesis had predictive value or not, recognizing that there are other variables that will also affect connectivity, body size being an obvious one. Um, but I think it's important to kind of note that, you know, large carnivores are pretty well represented in the literature on landscape connectivity. And most of the research we have done on that has been single species studies in single locations. We don't have many multi-species studies. We've got some reviews, but most of the very, most of the, the broader reviews have looked at kind of fishing expedition approaches to it. You know, does body size matter? Does method of locomotion matter? I mean, these things are important. But we haven't really gotten down into sort of predictive theories about how the ecology of a guild should affect differences within it. And I think competition will be the strongest one in this guild. But I, I completely agree with you that there's going to be other variables that are important to think about if you're looking for total predictive ability for connectivity, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Are you guys looking at um, the restored populations, uh, doing any genetic analysis on that to see like the dynamics of how they're reestablishing? Uh, no, we're kind of mostly, of, so, so Southern Africa is full of places with translocations where you know the species are managed in small protected areas. Uh, I guess my view of those is we kind of know what patterns we're gonna see because we just created them a few years ago when we translocated the animals. Um, there could be interesting follow-on questions about what happens next after that, but but no, we haven't we haven't got to that. Thanks, awesome talk. Um, I was curious with regards to the early part of the talk, um, where you sort of correlated snaring and human impacts on large herbivore populations. And I was wondering if there's anything in addition to human impacts that might be happening, like um, changes in the mega herbivore community or fire regime that might be causing changes in the landscape that have altered the abundance of these smaller bodied, more browsing species versus the large bodied grazers. Yeah, so I mean, it's a good point that there are things going on beyond just snaring that are affecting the densities of these species. Yeah, that's certainly true. Um, the most obvious being human encroachment into areas that uh, where it's not legal, but it's happening nonetheless. So there's, for instance, a huge area adjacent to Kukui National Park that has been degazetted because the human impact within it got high enough that it basically, you know, they gave up and they just redrew the line. Uh, so in places like that, you know, direct conversion of the land is is the more direct effect on what species we have there, as opposed to mortality due to snaring. Um, so yes, there are important things like that. Changes in fire regime. Most of these ecosystems, you know, uh, up to 70% of the ecosystem burns every year, mainly with human set fires. Um, so there's important effects going on there too. So yeah, certainly there are, there are impacts beyond the snaring. But I think I can fairly confidently say in these three ecosystems, the most direct and immediate effect on the, the composition and density of the herbivore populations is the snaring. The bushmeat trade is commercialized now, where this isn't subsistence hunting, this is snare hunting that's feeding back into the capital. Um, and, and, and the scale has gotten big enough that the rate of change is pretty dramatic. So for instance, uh, one of my grad students has a paper coming out maybe today, um, basically showing that the prey density in the Kafui ecosystem, which is a Miyambo woodland ecosystem, is uh, only about 30% of the density you would expect based upon studies of ecologically similar places with less impact. You know, 70% of it's gone, uh, and it's mostly the large species. But yeah, again, good points. Um, 
that's the next 10 years worth of work. <laughs> Looks like we answered them all. With, oh. um, thank you. And I was just wondering, the, the dogs that you saw that the population went extinct while you were studying them, um, do you know what the main driver there was? Was that, was that a, a snaring problem or? Uh, no, that was not mostly a snaring problem. That was a combination of recovering lion populations. So this is another one of these examples where as the lions rose, the dogs blipped out. Uh, so that's happened in the Ngorongo Crater. That's happened in Serengeti. That's now happened in Lua. Um, but also rabies. So the Lua ecosystem is a little bit unusual in that when the park was created um, from land that used to be owned by a big diamond operation, um, the, the, the local people who live there were built into the process of how the park would work. And they're allowed to be in the park with their livestock. Uh, they're mainly going in there to fish. So it's a funny ecosystem in that there are no permanent rivers, but there are all these pans that hold a lot of fish. And they go in there primarily for fishing. But they bring their dogs. And uh, there's rabies in the ecosystem. And we know that the dogs in that ecosystem were exposed to rabies before they disappeared. But when you're down to 20 animals, what deals the knockout blow at that point? I mean, this is demographic stochasticity manifesting itself. When you're down to a few dozen, something's going to get you. Kind of piggybacking on that, in these areas where, like in Lua, lions were extirpated, would that be a situation where, was there even an argument for not reintroducing lions there for the benefit of other species that are more rare? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. They weren't actually extirpated. They were just down to one. Uh, so there was still Lady Lua, this ancient female wandering around, following people around. She would hang out in our camp. Um, she had no one else to talk to. But uh, yeah, so they translated, they translocated lions from Kafui to Lua. and. You know, you could make a pretty strong argument that that's one reason why we don't have dogs in Lua anymore. Um, you probably wouldn't be fully wrong if you made that argument. Uh, it was primarily an economic decision. You know, they're trying to restore the ecosystem back to what it used to be. Uh, and that mainly focuses on trying to recover the wildebeest population to higher numbers and then get the carnivores that historically were there there and, and lions were historically there. The lions disappeared during the Angolan Civil War, so you know, they were directly removed by us, too. Yeah, you kind of, you're allowed to, you're allowed to want the world to look any way you want it to look, I guess. So, I mean, that's one possibility. You can focus wild dog conservation in places that are, hold lower density of lions and hyenas, certainly. Great, if everyone can uh, thank Scott for this wonderful talk. Mm -hmm.